Today, I'm going to be showing you guys how to set up your computers for web development in 2024 for both Windows and Mac. I'm not going to try to sell you on something. I'm not going to tell you to download a whole bunch of different apps that supposedly make you a better developer. I'm just going to share with you guys the absolute essentials that are completely free and could actually be used throughout the entirety of your career, carrying you from writing simple HTML, CSS, and JavaScript web pages all the way to building full stack web applications with React, Angular, and Vue. And in order to emulate how the installation process is going to be for you guys, I decided to wipe both my MacBook and my Windows PC completely clean, resetting everything, losing all my apps, losing, well, I didn't lose all my files. I backed that shit up, but damn, the things I do for content. <laughs> if you're new here, hi, I'm Mike. I make videos documenting my growth as a software engineer, my journey into the tech industry, building apps, experiencing life in my 20s, and all that sorts of fun stuff. If any of that sounds cool to you, be sure to subscribe and to turn on bell notifications to know when future videos drop. And if you enjoyed the video or found it helpful, I'd really appreciate it if you dropped a like and if you could share this video with a friend. Not only would it help me out, but it would also help the video reach more people, so I'd really appreciate the support. This video is actually a precursor to my upcoming Next.js tutorial, where I'll be teaching you guys how to build a simple full stack web application using React, TypeScript, Superbase, and Radix UI primitives. So if that sounds exciting to you guys, be sure to subscribe. I'll be dropping that video maybe like two weeks after this one. In fact, I actually wanted to cover this section in the tutorial itself, but I decided to make it into its own thing because I think it could help out more people outside of the tutorial. I first want to talk about the terminal, which is probably one of the most important pieces of software a developer could use. If you don't know what the terminal is, it's basically how you interact with your computer through text-based commands. And for developers, we use it to do a variety of different things, including spinning up a project, for example, using npx create next app to scaffold a Next.js project. We use it to install packages through things like npm or pip or whatever the fuck Rust uses, I think is like crate or something. We use it to track code changes using Git, and we use it to do some minor tasks as well, like creating new folders, moving files, renaming files, that sorts of stuff. I know for a lot of beginners, the terminal can be very intimidating for you, and it might feel like you need to know the absolute ins and outs of the terminal, but I'm here to assure you that you absolutely don't need to. I'll leave some resources in the description below. There are cheat sheets that could help you learn the essential terminal commands as well as essential Git commands. I actually have a physical version of the Git cheat sheet on me. I got this from my freshman year of college. You don't have to remember all of these right away. The more you build up projects, the more you'll actually use the terminal commands and these Git commands and all that type of shit. So don't worry about it too much. Just focus on building your apps and remembering this will just come by nature. In terms of the terminal app that I personally use, I like to use the one that's already built into macOS. I know that's not a very popular choice because there's a whole bunch of terminals out there that improve the developer experience in some way, shape or form, such as Warp, which introduced um, AI into the terminal and like autocomplete and all that type of shit. That might be a really cool option for you. There's also iTerm2, which is a very popular macOS terminal. There's also a lot of ways that you could customize the terminal, such as using Oh My Z Shell combined with, I think I used Power Level Powerline 10 Okay as like a theming thing, but I've kind of strayed away from customizing the terminal or like using a quote unquote better terminal than the one that's built in nowadays because I just don't care about the terminal all that much to take the time to personalize it and like add custom key bindings. The only customization I do to the default terminal is increasing the goddamn text size because that shit is small out of the box. I do not know why it's so goddamn small. I set it to like 13 or something, but yeah, that's the most customization I do with my terminal nowadays. Before we go ahead and start setting up the more interesting things of our setup, like our code editor and our browser, and yes, this is being filmed on an entirely different day. I'm sorry for ruining your immersion. Anyway, we have to install some extra things first to help us establish our overall dev environment. So we're gonna start off by covering the Mac OS section. If you are a Windows user, feel free to jump to the part where I talk about installing WSL. Otherwise, we're gonna go ahead and start installing this really, really cool tool for Mac OS called Homebrew which is a package manager for macOS that allows me to install everything I could possibly ever need for my MacBook, from my browser to my code editor to this really cool tool I use for editing called Auto Editor. Homebrew is seriously an essential for macOS regardless if you are a developer or not. And what makes it so great is that you could install everything just through a single command in the terminal. Gone are the days where I have to go to a website, download a .dmg file, open that file, and then drag the icon within that file into the application. 
All I got to do now is find the app I want on Homebrew's website, copy the command, paste the command into the terminal, and let Homebrew do everything for me. We can now go ahead and start installing Homebrew by visiting brew.sh, that is Homebrew's website, and on their homepage is a command for you to copy into the terminal and paste. What this command is gonna do is install everything it needs, as well as create folders that are needed by Homebrew. If you're worried that this is like some sort of virus that I'm telling you to install to your computer, don't worry, this is an open source project that's used by tens of thousands of people. But anyway, after the script is done running, the last step we need to do is to copy and paste these two commands into the terminal and run them. What this is basically gonna do is allow Homebrew's command brew to actually be usable in the system. If we don't do this, then we cannot use Homebrew. After running those two commands, Congratulations, you have successfully installed Homebrew, and you could check that it works by typing in the brew command. Before we can move on and actually use the terminal to do anything code related on Windows, we need to install something called the Windows Subsystem for Linux, or WSL for short. Basically what this does is it adds a Linux layer on top of Windows and allows you to interact with the Linux operating system itself through Windows. And this is beneficial for developers in lots of ways, including how you don't have to dual boot into a different operating system now, as well as being able to interact with the tools that we use daily for web development very easily because we're running it all through Linux rather than through Windows, which could be an absolute mess. Let's now go ahead and start installing WSL. So the first thing we need to do is we need to go over to the downwards caret icon that's next to the plus icon. Click that, and once you do, you should be presented with a list of options. We now need to right click on Windows PowerShell and you should have an option that says run as administrator. Click on that, Windows will then ask you for admin access. And once the admin window for Windows PowerShell pops up, you wanna type in the command WSL double dash install. This will install everything you need to run WSL itself, including the built-in virtual machine, as well as a Linux distro. In this case, it comes with Ubuntu by default. After that's finished running, it should tell you to reboot your computer. So go ahead and do that. And I'll see you guys after the reboot. After it's done rebooting, it'll present you with the option to create your user account for Linux. Go ahead and enter a name, and then after that, it'll prompt you for a password. Keep in mind that when you do enter a password, it's not gonna show you the characters as you type. It's like a security feature or something. Once that's finished, congratulations, you now have Ubuntu installed on your system. Now, before we move on to installing other stuff used for coding, I do want to customize my terminal a bit. I personally do not use PowerShell or the command prompt or the Azure shell or anything like that. So I like to go ahead and hide it from the terminal settings. I also like to set my default terminal to be Ubuntu. That way, whenever I open the Windows terminal again, it'll always open up in Ubuntu. Now we could focus on installing the fun stuff, the actual things that we'll be using on our day-to-day -day as a web developer. The first thing we're gonna install is a code editor. Now there's a whole bunch of editors you could choose from, from staples like Sublime to new kids on the block like Zed. But I'm gonna go ahead and recommend that you install the thing that everyone uses, which is Visual Studio Code, a partially open source text editor built by Microsoft. VS Code is pretty much the gold standard when it comes to code editors, and it is 100% an essential to not just web developers, but to all developers. Like others, I really enjoy VS Code for its customization, especially through its plugin ecosystem, but my number one favorite feature with VS Code has to be its tight-knit integration with both Git and GitHub. Now, don't get me wrong, I 100% recommend that you get familiar with using Git through the terminal, but man, having a graphical user interface to interact with Git makes things so much easier and makes me so much faster when it comes to coding. I'm able to do all the essential Git actions through the GUI alone, including creating new branches, writing commit messages, push, pull, fetch, uh, all that type of shit. And the cherry on top is the GitHub integration because I don't have to leave VS Code to clone a repository or to create a new repository. I could do all of that within VS Code itself. and. That is amazing. That is seriously an essential to my workflow and it lets me not manage a whole bunch of windows on my desktop. I could just stick to VS Code. Okay, I have hyped up VS Code enough. Uh, let's actually install it now and we could install it using Homebrew. All you got to do is go to the search box and type in visual-studio-code. Click on the one under the casks category and then once you're on the page, you will be greeted with a very, very simple brew command that you could easily copy and paste into the terminal and you just sit back and relax and let Homebrew do everything for you. After the command is finished running, congrats, you have officially installed VS Code onto your system and you'll know that it's successfully installed because once you open Launchpad, you'll see VS Code right there. It is that simple. So the most common way to install VS Code on Windows is to go to the VS Code website and to download the .exe, but I like to do it a very unpopular way. And that is by downloading it 
through the Microsoft Store. Yes, I am a Microsoft Store oh, user. I know. Hell no. Whichever way you install VS Code, once it's done installing, we want to open it because at its current state, it'll always default to opening in the Windows file system. We want it to be able to open in the Linux file system. That way we could store all of our coding shit in Ubuntu. In order to do that, we need to go over to the extensions panel and searching up WSL. Once you find the plugin, be sure to install it. And now you have access to connecting VS Code to Ubuntu. So make sure that before you go ahead and make a new project, you go down to the bottom left where it's sort of like this blue icon with two carrot arrow thingies. You click that and then it should present you with the menu that says connect to WSL. You wanna click that and once you see WSL colon Ubuntu at the bottom left, that means that you are using the Linux file system, meaning you could create your folders and it'll show up in Linux rather than on Windows. Cool, so we got VS Code set up on Windows and to work with WSL now, let's focus on installing our JavaScript runtime environment. JavaScript was initially built to only be used within the browser, AKA the client side. Eventually a project called Node.js was born, and what Node does is it provides an environment for JavaScript code to execute on the computer itself rather than just in the browser. Because of Node.js, that is how we have modern full stack web development, where we have a back end and a front end, where the back end is handled by Node.js. Node.js used to be the only option for a JavaScript runtime environment until very recently, actually, when projects like Bun and Dino popped up. However, we're going to go ahead and install Node.js. Those two projects are still very early on in their development and haven't received widespread adoption yet. That being said, feel free to explore Bun or Dino on your own time. I'm just going to continue on with showing you guys how to install Node.js, which in this case, I'm going to install through a version manager. So what a version manager does is it allows you to switch between Node versions on the fly whenever you want. And this could be helpful for the case where you need to utilize an older version of Node for a project. NVM or Node Version Manager is the most popular version manager for Node.js. However, we're going to be going with a much newer solution that is built off of Rust called FNM or Fast Node Manager. There is a way to install FNM through Brew. However, I do not recommend it. I recommend instead to go onto FNM's GitHub repo, scrolling down into the README to the installation section, and there will be a script for you to run in your terminal. That script is going to handle everything from installing FNM to setting up your environment variables that actually allow the system to use FNM and all that type of stuff. However, before we could actually copy and paste this script into the terminal, we need to install a dependency called unzip, and we could do that by typing in the command sudo apt install unzip. Go ahead and run that command. And once that's finished, we could finally go ahead and copy and paste the curl command, let it run. And then after there is a final step, which is to refresh your terminal using the command that was provided. After that, we can now use FNM. Let's go ahead and now install Node.js. And we could do that by typing in the terminal FNM install, and we're gonna add two arguments to it. The first argument being double dash LTS. What this means is that we want to install the LTS version of Node.js. LTS stands for long-term support. It's the version of Node that is supported for six years, I believe. The next argument we're gonna add is double dash core pack dash enabled. Basically, when you install Node normally, it installs a thing called NPM or the Node Package Manager. What NPM does is it allows us to use third-party code and install third-party libraries and all that type of shit into our projects. So these could be things like custom component libraries, custom hooks, and things of that nature. However, NPM isn't the only option for package managers out there. There's also PNPM and Yarn. I personally use PNPM, and normally if I wanted to use PNPM, I would have to install it as its own thing. However, there is an experimental feature that comes with Node.js itself that I just found out about literally last night called core pack, but it basically allows you to utilize other package managers without having to install them directly. And it allows you to specify which package manager you want a project to use by specifying it within the package.json. Go ahead and run that command. It shouldn't take that long, but after it's done, the last thing we need to do is to tell the system which version of Node we want to use. We could go ahead and type in FNM list to list out all the versions of Node that we installed. Uh, we only installed the version 20.11.1. Now that we have that number, we could type in the command FNM use and then put in 20.11.1. And after you type in that, we now have Node set up and we could test out Node by typing in Node in the terminal. If it's successful, it should show you the Node CLI. So I just wanted to make a quick correction. This is the wrong command to use in order to set your default Node version for your system. FNM used is supposed to be used for when you need to switch to a different version of Node if you need it for a project. However, if you want to set your default version for your system, you need to use the command FNM default followed by the Node version. In this case, we're using 20.11. One. Just wanted to make that quick correction. Oopsie. 
Yeah, that's about it. Congratulations, you now have Node.js installed. If you're still writing projects that just utilize simple HTML, CSS, JavaScript files, you're probably not going to be using Node yet. But the moment you jump into using things like React, Vue, Angular, or even things like Svelte, Solid, or whatever, you most likely will be using Node, especially if you're using those things through a server-side framework like Next.js, SvelteKit, Solid Start. So that's why I encourage you guys to just have it installed into your system. That way, once you get to that point, you are absolutely ready to build. The last thing I wanted to talk about are web browsers. And I'm just going to cut to the chase here. Use whatever fucking web browser you want. I wanted to explicitly say this because a lot of web developers will recommend that you use a Chromium based browser. When they say that, they basically mean install Google Chrome itself or like a Chrome derivative such as Brave, Arc, even Microsoft Edge, I guess. And a lot of the times people would recommend using a Chromium based browser just because of the built in development tools. And they would even go as far as saying that these tools are just so much better than the ones compared to Safari or Firefox that you should just use Chrome for that very reason when it comes to web development. And I got curious about that. So I tried out all the dev tools for Chrome, Firefox, and Safari, and I found that the features are more or less the same. And the overall experience of debugging CSS issues or JavaScript issues or whatever the fuck are pretty much the same because they all have a console. You know, they all have like adjustments for viewports. They all have element selectors and all that type of shit. So what I'm trying to say is I wouldn't go ahead and use a Chromium based browser just because of the dev tools. I would only consider using a Chromium based browser because it's the most popular type of browser out there. I'm sure it's no secret that Chrome has the largest market share when it comes to browsers. Therefore, I think it's a smart idea for you to be building your web apps and debugging them in the same environment that most people would be consuming your web app in. But again, don't think too hard about it. If you want to use Safari, use Safari. If you want to use Firefox, use Firefox. It really doesn't fucking matter. All that matters is the browser you choose works the way you want it to and could actually help you debug your code and solve your problems. So yeah. Like I said in the beginning, I'm not going to tell you to install a whole bunch of things. This is seriously all you need for full stack web development in 2024. This has been my setup for both Windows and Mac for the longest time. I seriously haven't need to use anything else. And yeah, it just helps me stay focused on what I'm building and get shit done. Congrats on your new setup. I really hope you have lots of fun building your future web apps using it. Uh, it's getting pretty late right now. It is 1244. I am going to go ahead and go to bed. So um, check out this really cool outfit change what the fuck is this thanks so much for taking the time to watch this video i know this isn't the most flashy sort of setup video of course there are some things that developers use to like help with their productivity like um, notion or linear or like shit like that but i just wanted to cover the essentials you need to actually start coding if you found this video helpful i'd really appreciate it if you could give it a like and if you could share this with a friend who you think could really benefit from this and if you want to follow along on my software engineering journey feel free to subscribe thanks very much for watching once again and i'll see you guys in the next video Drink water. What the fuck was that?